Abraham Owens is Punched, Drunk, and All Out of Fucks, a novel by Jordan Crumby. Read by Jordan Crumby. Prologue. It's night, because it has to be night. Chaos wants darkness. It demands darkness. He knows this because chaos whispers it to him. This person, this man, this thing, is not the hero of the story. Chaos tells him to sit at the farthest edge of the narrow room. He's at the corner of a small table where fingers of darkness are able to reach out from the shadows of the dimly lit bar and grab hold of him. He feels the touch of darkness as if it were tangible, a numb and empty cold dancing across his flesh. Perfect, Chaos whispers. He agrees. He has no reason not to. Chaos has never once led him astray or made a fool of him. Even if he doesn't immediately understand a direction, he understands that chaos demands patience. So he sits. And he waits. He wears a hooded blazer in a dark shade of green that brings out an unnatural, verdant hue in otherwise dark eyes. A pale, narrow face is resigned to neutrality as he waits, as if he's able to sidestep linear time, his body slipping into a state of hibernation until chaos whispers. A stein of dark beer sits on the table in front of him, filled to the top. The foam has long since receded. He hasn't touched it, and he's not going to. It's almost as if the beer is for show. Because it is. He's been sitting like this for nearly an hour. Sitting, waiting, anticipating the whisper. He is patient because chaos demands it. He knows that surface dwellers will see this as a contradictory observation. But chaos operates on no timetable. Chaos exists as plainly as time itself, gravity, or humanity's inescapable desire to wage war against itself, murdering and killing in the name of one imaginary god or another. But he knows there is no god. The glory goes only to chaos. And chaos is patient because chaos is inevitable. Soon, chaos whispers, a silent and breathy voice in his ear. He feels something stir in his groin. A small group of three enters the bar, and he evaluates them quickly from the shadows. The happy couple exchanges a quick kiss, and the friend, an obvious third-wheel hanger-on, beelines for the bar to order the first round. Light catches flecks of green in those dark eyes as he considers the girl being kissed. He evaluates her in a cold, calculating fashion, like a person reviewing the dinner bill to ensure everything is in order, or a cut of meat to ensure it's the right size and isn't too fatty. Instinct told him she could be interesting. She's the right weight, the right figure, the right kind of simple, vapid willingness plastered across her face, one of those insipid and dull traits that remain so rampant among the surface dwellers. Instinct tells him she could be interesting. Chaos whispers, no. The boyfriend, on the other hand, is perfect. Strapping, immaculately scruffy hair perfected after hours of mirror time, arms that long to be twisted and pinned, full, pliable lips that beg for a forceful touch, Eyes that sparkle and plead to be owned and controlled. Yes, the boyfriend would certainly be enjoyable to play with. Chaos is patient, but even chaos can be tempted. Wait. Beneath his neutral expression, an angry flash of frustration sparks. It's an impatience that will undoubtedly cause chaos to scowl in disappointment, if only it had the countenance to do so. He took a long, calming breath. Perhaps they would be tasty appetizers, but the happy couple isn't who he's waiting for. Maybe another day. Too many variables had already been aligned, and there still remains a handful to nudge into place, like pawns on a chessboard. This singular encounter is essential for events yet to come. He needs to be ready. He needs to be patient. This is too important to allow for frivolous distractions. Yes, soon, Chaos whispers. Once again, the door to the bar opens and someone enters. His breath catches in his throat. He feels something tighten in his chest. Excitement? Anticipation? Joy? Dark green eyes sparkle, revealing a sense of raw, if not subtle, thrill. Abraham Owens has arrived. He recognizes him on sight. It's been years, but the brute hasn't changed. He matches almost perfectly the old photos and recent anecdotal descriptions. Owens is massive easily 6'4", with broad shoulders and a commanding presence. His head is shaved and his jaw is covered in stubble. His nose looks to have been on the receiving end of too many punches. No, 
Abraham Owens doesn't look like a hero. He doesn't even look like a villain. Abraham Owens looks like the goon the villain hires as one of the henchmen fated to die in the first act. He watches as Owens settles at the opposite edge of the bar. There's an exchange with the bartender. Back in the far corner, over the untouched beer, he muses that Owens probably prefers grunts over words. As he observes the other man, he starts to calculate how drunk Owens must have already been just to have walked into the bar in the first place. Putting aside Owens's condition, a man of his size must have a high tolerance for alcohol. To be in a room this full of people, he must have already been wasted. That sensual, breathy voice tickles his ear with words no one else can hear. Yes, now. He watches as Owen slams back glass after glass of whiskey. This is it. This is what he waits for. Abraham Owens is who he waits for. This is what chaos waits for. Owens continues drinking. He's putting it away fast. The waiting is almost over. A smile pulls at his lips, twisting the neutral expression into something demonic. Now. He begins to stand before surprising himself by hesitating. When he settles back into the chair, the rage that had simmered for so long continues to bubble and rise. He can taste it like bile in the back of his throat, a stinging acid pricking his nose. Abraham Owens is right there. And yet he hesitates. Is he denying chaos? Is he trying to exert some kind of divine control over chaos? Impossible. Chaos is patient. Chaos is inevitable. Chapter 1 Well, fuck. No matter how much cheap alcohol I poured on it, this little field trip to Dockside Bar wasn't turning into a good idea anytime soon. Better try the expensive stuff, then. The bartender, Jimmy, had a genuine look of surprise when I sat down. Abraham Owens, he said, drying his hands on a dish rag. Jesus, it's been a hot minute. How you doing, buddy? I gestured to a bottle just below the top shelf and grunted. Less chit-chat, more whiskey. Jimmy squinted, and I didn't need super empathy to see he was trying to figure out how deep in the bag I already was. Four singles, a case of some pansy-ass hard lemonade, good, cheap alcohol content, the last quarter of a respectable bottle of spiced rum, and flavored vodka I only touched when there was no other options. And that was just to get me down the street to Dockside. Fortunately, I held my liquor like I took a punch, and I met Jimmy's gaze with a steely one of my own. We gonna make eyes at each other all night? I growled. I fished my money clip out and peeled a Franklin off the wad. Leave the bottle, keep the change. Jimmy gave a half shrug, grabbed the whiskey, and filled the glass. I slammed it back and immediately refilled it rolling my shoulders as I felt the weight of the other bar patrons slowly ease off my back. Dockside wasn't packed, but it was still Friday night at the local haunt. A handful of people would make my skin crawl. More than a handful? Well, if it weren't for the booze, I'd be suffocating. This was a really fucking bad idea. I knocked back the second glass of whiskey, and the field trip still didn't look any rosier. The alcohol burned its way down my throat, and my back released more tension. You doing okay there, Abe? Jimmy asked, putting on a fine show of playing the sympathetic bartender. Not that I'm cynical. I raised the third glass of whiskey and cheers. Never better, I lied, overemphasizing my words and popping my eyes in what I hoped looked like confident certainty, but probably read as angry drunk. Someone flagged Jimmy from the other end of the bar. Before he stepped away, he knocked twice in the bar top. Just go easy for me, okay? I waved him off with a grunt. I hadn't dragged my ass to Dockside and risked emotional suffocation from a bar full of drunk strangers just to cause Jimmy a bit of late-night trouble. No, I wanted, for once in my shit stain of a life, to experience a total abdication of reality. Some people drink to forget. Some people drink to numb away the pain of life. Some people drink because there's nothing else left to do. Me? After years of detailed field research, I can safely check the box for all of the above. And then some. The night was fuzzy, and I honestly couldn't say if my ex-wife had been on my mind before I came to Dockside. It could have been the memory of her and the associated guilt that drove me to abandon the safety and isolation of my trailer in the first place. Maybe I had been thinking about her, and maybe I hadn't. Either way, I was definitely thinking about her now. Truth was, there wasn't many days when I didn't think about her. My phone buzzed in my pocket. I checked the display on the outside of the flip phone and saw it was Valdez, and then clicked the side button to dismiss the call. She was a good kid, just trying to be a decent friend, which was the last thing I was interested in right now. 
After pocketing the phone, I turned and leaned against the bar, bringing a fresh glass of whiskey to my lips. I scanned the crowd to see if there was anybody I could use to disappoint Jimmy. After all, if you can't run from your problems, the next best thing was to find someone willing to beat them out of you. Plus, it wasn't every day that I got to be around so many people without a crippling tidal wave of emotional suffocation. Even after the third glass of whiskey, the pull was still there. It was a kind of psychic magnetism that attracted the emotions of anyone nearby. The stronger the pull, the more I was overwhelmed with someone's entire emotional state. Too many people with too many emotions, and I might as well have suffered a fucking lobotomy. Behind the growing dam of alcohol, the pull was muted, distant, and thankfully far from crippling. But like climate change, capitalism, and the Republican Party, it was still there. As my gaze drifted from person to person, I picked up the faint chords, almost imperceptible vibrations of their emotional states. If not for the already copious amounts of alcohol, these subtle twangs would have been clues that painted vivid pictures of each person's life. Hunger. Lust. Lots of sloppy, drunk happy. Someone was harboring a fit of anger that danced particularly close to an infectious, all-consuming rage. But it was all so distant that I could almost, almost ignore it. Booze was a beautiful thing. There may have been a more effective way to mitigate the emotional plague, or maybe even a way to control it. But as long as I stayed isolated, or remained well lubricated as the case may be, there was never any reason to suffer through the exploration of my psychic limits. Fuck. Even if I tried, it would probably end up killing me. Death by feeling. Brain exploded with raw emotion. Someone called Guinness World Records. I took a healthy sip of whiskey and immediately choked on it when I saw her face. It was my ex-wife. I glimpsed her as my gaze skimmed across the bar patrons. I immediately choked on the whiskey, my blurry vision going watery. As quickly as I had spotted her, her face was gone, lost in the small crowd. It was a fleeting instant fueled by enough alcohol to kill a small horse, but I was sure it was her. At least, I think I was sure. Problem was, she'd been dead for two years. Her name was Priscilla. Growing up, she hated when other kids called her Prissy for short, so from the time she was 12, Priscilla insisted on going by her middle name. Personally, I don't see how Gertrude was much of an improvement. The thing is, though, she was always my Gertie, right from the beginning. I didn't even know Priscilla was her first name until we were signing paperwork during a shotgun elopement in Vegas. Before everything went south, I made a decent living as a contractor, specializing in all things brick and concrete. I had started the business with my brother, and things had gone pretty well for us until the shit hit the fan. It was hard, honest work, and a far cry from the type of questionably legal gig work I take these days whenever funds run low. Gertie, on the other hand, was fucking brilliant. Seriously, she had a PhD in economics, and even appeared on a few of those cable news programs to talk about policy proposals or something. The whole thing was beyond me for sure, but Gertie never made me feel dumb about it. She was good to me. She was good to everyone. We liked to shop for campers and plan for a nomadic life, traveling across the country. She wanted a traditional motorhome-style RV. I wanted a massive trailer we could pull behind the truck. We settled on a small three-bedroom, two-bath bungalow because that was the sensible thing to do. And when you're happy and talking about kids, it makes sense to be sensible. In hindsight, it was good that we bought the house. After the accident, and when her migraines began... I was able to retrofit one of the extra rooms into a soundproof, lightproof cave for her to ride out the pain. I already felt bad enough, because there's only so much you can do for a person suffering from chronic migraines. She tried all the meds, but nothing would touch it. She needed darkness, silence, and time to ride it out. Aside from retrofitting her cave, there wasn't anything else I could do for her. Other than leaving her alone, that is. And then, that empathy thing started flaring up. I didn't know what was happening at first. I thought it was just coincidentally getting headaches at the same time as Gertie. Some kind of sympathetic hormonal bullshit or whatever. But the headaches escalated, and I soon suffered full-fledged migraines right alongside Gertie. They started late in the day as a persistent, throbbing drumbeat in my temples and the vice-like grip of an 800-pound gorilla clenching my skull. Glowing and distorted auras punctuated a sensitivity to light that felt like shards of glass slicing into my optic nerves. Layers of pain compounded until the nausea demanded the constant presence of a puke bucket. There were times when we would spend all day lying in the cave, not daring to move. 
It was during one of those quiet moments, in between waves, when I first properly noticed the pull. In the silence of our cave, I suddenly started laughing. They were big, belly laughs that shook the bed. The outburst must have split Gertie's head in two because I immediately felt an ice pick in my own brain. Later, I would learn that a package had been delivered to our front door, and the delivery driver was listening to a funny podcast. I had a little help putting two and two together, but the end result was that this super empathy bullshit just meant that, instead of Gertie suffering alone, two people were going to be crippled by her migraines. And that was in addition to the flood of emotions I was now picking up from our neighbors and my daily colleagues. I'm the first to admit I'm not the sharpest tack in the box. My path to problem solving tends to begin and end with my fists. But at the time, I didn't see any other option. I needed to get away from everybody, Gertie included. So I did. That's how I wound up in a run-down 32-foot toe-behind in the far corner of an RV park. I left the construction business to my brother, who all but crucified me for walking out on Gertie. While I was busy finding relief in isolation, my brother was busy finding religion, the evangelical kind with a hateful, spiteful God that hid behind a cheap facade his followers wanted you to believe was love. Of course, I had tried to make my brother understand the situation and what we were collectively suffering through, but this freshly minted Jesus freak fuck had embraced a narrow, black and white worldview where there was no room for shades of gray. Angry, intermittent browbeating shifted to excommunication, and eventually I lost all track of him. Last I heard, he had skipped town on some evangelical mission to spread shame, sexual purity, and recruit souls for that hateful fuck of a god. As for Gertie, less than six months after I left her, I found out she had died from an aneurysm. She wasn't even 35. This super empathy bullshit is a bitch. It's a crushing weight when I'm around any group of people, debilitating in every way imaginable. I say all of that to say this. As lobotomized and helpless as my empathy makes me feel, even at its absolute worst in the biggest, shittiest crowd of fucktards imaginable, it still pales in comparison to the weight of guilt I carry for abandoning my wife. <laughs>